Buffy St. Marie, a multimedia life, a new documentary which is just out, along with her latest album, her 18th. It's called Running for the Drum. It's her first album in 13 years and won the Canadian Juno Award for Aboriginal Album of the Year. I sat down with Buffy St. Marie here in our Firehouse studio to talk about her life, music, activism, and politics. I began by asking her where she began, where she was born. I'm told I was born in Canada, but I, I was adopted and I grew up in Maine and Massachusetts. And your family there? My family in Maine and Massachusetts are part Native American and part everything else. <laughs> and then where did you go from there? How um, old were you when you left? Oh, I was an infant when I was born. I mean, I was an infant when I, when I was living in Canada, but when I was adopted, I was, I was a baby. So I grew up uh, in Maine and Massachusetts, and I returned to Saskatchewan as, um, in my late teens. And from my early 20s on, I spent a lot of time there. I was um, reunited with people who may or may not be my real relatives, but we've made family together, and we're close. <laughs> and when did you discover music as a way to express yourself? I think I was about three. I mean, that's, it's my earliest memory of music. And I saw a piano, and I didn't play Barbies, and I didn't play sports. I, I played art. I made pictures, and I danced, and I listened to music, and I played piano. And um, I, I found out two years ago that I'm actually dyslexic in music. So I can write for an orchestra, but I can't read it back. I, I, I learn by ear instead of by eye. Did people in your family play music? Uh, a few did. A few did, yeah, but uh, it's not as though there was any kind of professional musicianship or... Um, it was just in you? Yeah. It was in me. It was a... Uh, and I think that most people are naturally what we call talented. Like when you take a bunch of little kids to the beach, they all make music and they make rhythm and they dance and they use their imaginations and they make drama and they make sandcastles and architecture. So I think that I'm one of the lucky few who just managed to hold on to that through a school and business and um, it, it's, I, I still feel like a kindergartner about the arts. When, Buffy, did you start to perform publicly? And were you afraid at the beginning? You know, <clears throat> I was in college, I went to the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and I started playing songs for the girls in my dorm, and my house mother, Teresa de Kerpoli, who was from Europe, she really encouraged me, and she encouraged me to listen to people like Edie Piaf, Carmen Amaya, the flamenco dancer, singer, um, people from other countries. So from the start of uh, playing for other people, I was absorbing and reflecting, I think, a, a very wide world culture. International students at the university were a big influence on me. So um, it was kind of natural to me when the, when the, uh, the, what they were calling folk music, which also included singer-songwriters, it was very natural for me to fall into that time in the early 60s when students ruled and the, the venues were coffee houses, not beer halls, and coffee, it was talk, 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 listen, listen, listen. So. Um, it just became a way of life for me to have a little small concert somewhere off campus. And then in the early 60s, I went to Greenwich Village, although I had just graduated and I thought I was going to continue my study in Oriental Philosophy, which was my major. But I didn't. I got real lucky and I got bus tickets and airplane tickets and started traveling around to safe places, which coffee houses were. It was a qu quite a different time for a young artist. You, know, you could do that safely and sing for your peers. And the songs that I was writing, with, that was the only thing that kept me from being unafraid on stage. I didn't think I was going to last more than, you know, the next month. And the songs that I was writing, I thought people sort of ought to hear but also deserve to hear because I knew I was reflecting some points of view that um, weren't being uh, verbalized but they were felt by fellow students, like things about Native American stuff and um, um, love songs with a, a, a more feeling than just, you know, I'm going to die if I don't get you in bed tonight, or um, things like Universal Soldier. When did you write Universal Soldier? How I wrote Universal you? Soldier uh, very early, um, in the 60s. Um, and uh, it was just 
it was it, it was both original to me, but it was also an absorption and a reflection of what I was seeing in the streets and in, on college campuses. He's five foot two, and he's six feet four. He fights with missiles and with spears. He's all 31, and he's only 17. He's been a soldier for a thousand years. He's a Catholic, a Hindu, an atheist, a chain, a Buddhist, and a Baptist, and a Jew. And he knows he shouldn't kill, and he knows he always will kill you for me, my friend, and me for you. And he's fighting for Canada, he's fighting for France, he's fighting for the USA. And he's fighting for the Russians, and he's fighting for Japan. And he thinks we'll put an end to war this way. And he's fighting for democracy and fighting for the Reds. He says it's for the peace of all. He's the one who must decide who's to live and who's to die. And he never sees the writing on the walls. But without him, Hitler have condemned him at Dachau. Without him, Caesar would have stood alone. He's the one who gives his body as a weapon to a war. And without him, all this killing can't go on. He's the universal soldier, and he really is to blame. But his orders come from far away no more. They come from him and you and me. And brothers, can't you see? This is not the way we put an end to war. Did it just explode on the scene as soon as you started to sing it? I mean, we're talking about now in the 60s of the Vietnam yeah. War. Early, of course. early 60s, yeah. Uh, it kind of did. I mean, I got popular and famous right away. And um, I, I was very, very fortunate in that I, I could travel um, where my, the other girls who had graduated college with me, they couldn't travel. I could travel. And I had a Native American um, background and really interest in knowing what um, had not been told to me. Because when I was growing up, um, my, my mother who raised me, she especially told me, you know, what you see in the movies and reading books is not necessarily true, but you can find out someday. So I used my show business airplane tickets to, you know, I'd have a concert in Paris and then I'd go up to the Arctic and I'd spend time with the indigenous people there, or a concert in New York, because I was living in Greenwich Village then. Um, I'd go up to Akwesasne, the Mohawk Reservation, you know, in, at the top of New York on the Canadian border. And it kind of became the the paradigm of my life. I wasn't intentionally trying to become a bridge for anything, but I did see that um, people in the cities, they wanted to know. And um, you asked, you know, was I, af was I afraid to be on stage? I wasn't because of the songs, see. It, I didn't think I was much of a singer, but because of the songs, um, I had the, the nerve to step out onto a stage and to give the people the song. So I wasn't concentrating on myself as a singer. I probably should have been concentrating more. 